Welcome to Smart Catalyst number 12, 2018. So today we are going to see all these prelims articles. The first one is why tigers are important. The second one is Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And third one is Ripples of Discord, which is on LIGO. And the fourth and fifth articles are about eminent personalities, Acharya J.B. Kripalani and Maulana Abul Kalam Asad. And the last prelims article is The Power Minister Inaugurates Inspire 2018. So the first article is why are tigers important? So the news here is recently there are a lot of protests happening because of the killing of tiger Avni in Maharashtra. So in relation with that news, it is very relevant to know about the importance of tiger and its conservation. So if we want to know about the tiger, the tiger is the top predator of the food chain. In an ecological permit, the tiger is the top most species. So it is very sure that we have to conserve it because the tigers are an umbrella species, which means conserving tiger leads to the conservation of other species which is present in the same ecological permit below it. Okay. So if you conserve this, automatically these species are also getting conserved. So the IUCN status of tiger is endangered. And they are long ranging species, which means it requires vast amount of habitat to survive. For example, male uh, tiger require like 150 square kilometer to 1000 kilo square kilometer. So hence the habitat loss of tigers as well as the fragmentation which is happening. So these items needs to be addressed. So we are having certain acts as well as certain projects in order to conserve the wildlife. One such project is Project Tiger to conserve the tiger population and one such act is Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So now we are going to see this Wildlife Protection Act. Okay. So as per this act, it is an act of Parliament of India enacted for protection of both plants as well as the animal species. So under this Wildlife Protection Act, they actually established certain schedules of the plants and animal species and their status. So these are the key provisions of Wildlife Protection Act. So the first one is if any animal species is in the schedule 1 or 2 then it is the category of endangered species so killing of such animals or trading of such animals lead to stringent penalties okay so it is very stringent schedule 1 and 2 so if you see schedule 3 and 4 it is similar to schedule 1 and 2 but it is not dealing with the endangered species rather it deals with the less threatened species so the penalties are not that much stringent it is little bit lesser than the schedule 1 and 2 and the schedule 5 is like the animals that can be hunted so you can hunt this animal if such animal is declared as a vermin vermin means it is threat to the crops or the plantations etc so if they are threat then you can kill that animal for example nilgai so these are all for animal species and the schedule 6 initially it was actually aiming at only the conservation of plant species but later it just included the uh, establishment of animal parks in order to protect the animal species also so in this case the tiger which is endangered it is in the schedule 1 so in this slide we are going to see what is the procedure to remove the man eater which is the tiger so we all knew that recently the human and the animal conflict is increasing heavily so we have to address these concerns right so usually the capturing of these animal species is the preferred option rather than killing of those animal species but if in case those animal species are becoming a threat to the human beings or dangerous to the human life itself then killing is the last resort so for that there is some provisions in the schedule 1 of WPA which enabled the killing of those species if it become dangerous to human life as well as the chief wildlife warden of a state alone has the permission or authority to hunting such animals if it becomes dangerous to the human life okay so it is put forward by NTCA which is the National Tiger Conservation Authority and now we are going to see that so it is a statutory body under the Ministry of Environment, which is constituted under the provisions of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And its main purpose is for strengthening of the tiger conservation. So this NTCA is a centrally sponsored scheme of Environment Ministry, which provide the funding support to tiger range states such as Karnataka, Assam, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, uncertain parts of Tamil Nadu also okay so these are tiger rain states and it is a centrally sponsored scheme to provide funding to these states for in-situ conservation of the tigers in those tiger reserves so that we can save it from complete extinction so this NTCA is also responsible for the conduction of tiger census okay so what is the way forward here is 
we all knew that as per the article 51a it is the fundamental duty for every citizen in order to conserve the wildlife so we have to keep in mind about that and we have to take part in that in order to conserve the wildlife which in turn helps to maintain the ecological balance so the next article is ripples of discord on gravitational waves so now we are going to see what are these gravitational waves are so consider two stars in space so if these two stars come to uh, come closer to each other and if they collide against each other then this force creates a ripples in the space and this ripple of waves is called the gravitational waves okay so in order to detect such gravitational waves the global community has constituted a lot of experiments one such experiment is LIGO which is the laser interferometer gravitational observatory so now we are going to see when these stars are colliding against each other in the sense always inside a star there is a fusion reaction is going on okay by means of helium hydrogen etc and when these fuels are getting exhausted then this fusion reaction is getting decreased which in turn causes the catastrophic burst of such stars and while bursting certain portion of the stars is expelled back into the surrounding space but the stars core cannot escape this kind of pull of gravity so in a star certain portion is getting expelled but the inner core of the star is collapsing inwards okay so this constituted the black hole okay so this black hole is a region where the gravity is very strong not even a single object can escape from this gravity even the light cannot escape from this gravity even the light can be easily consumed into this black hole okay so we already have seen this black hole right so one more thing is binary black hole binary means two that means two black holes are taking part in this process which means either two black holes are merging towards each other or accelerating and moving towards each other and finally creating or finally merging so there it creates some ripples which is known as the gravitational waves okay and it is only fine found by means of this LIGO so in LIGO we are having like two L shaped tunnel right so if two waves are perfectly uh, symmetric then there is no difference between the two waves and there is no gravitational wave but if suppose the two waves are asymmetric then obviously there is a difference and this difference is achieved in or this difference is observed at the end and this is what the gravitational wave okay so that is what they stated in this point any acceleration which is not spherically or cylindrically symmetric that means if it is asymmetric then it is producing the gravitational wave for example supernovae and spinning stars so in the past that means in 2015 this LIGO detected the G waves and so far six detections have been found and out of that five due to the black hole merging and one due to the neutron star merging okay and Virgo is another detector which is used to find the same gravitational waves but what the news here is the few scientists have questioned the validity of such detection because whatever the data that is submitted by the scientist about this gravitational waves thus those data is containing the noise samples in it so thereby the detection of gravitational waves is not perfect it contains lot of errors that is what the few scientists have questioned the validity itself so it is a concern right so see in this picture these are two black holes which are merging towards each other thereby producing the gravitational waves and we are having two tunnels right if there is no gravitational wave there is no difference in this wave if there is a gravitational wave it affects the wave thereby creating the difference and we can observe at the end so the next article is Acharya J.B. Kripalni so yesterday was the birthday of uh, Kripalni as well as Maulana Abul Kalam Asad so in that context we have to know about these personalities so first if we see about this JP Kripalni he is an a Gandhian socialist environmentalist and educationist and he was born in Hyderabad in 1888 and he earned the title Acharya around 1922 when he was teaching at Gujarat Vidyapit founded by Mahatma a couple of years before 1922 so before he got involved in India's freedom movement he was like teaching at various places from 1912 to 1927 and he met Mahatma Gandhi during the Champaran Satyagraha in the year 1917. So these are the some of the facts about him. That means he became the Congress president in 1946 but he resigned from his position in 1947 and later he started the Kishan Mazdur Praja Party in the year 1951. And during the Indira Gandhi's period, he and certain other socialist leaders led some 
non violent protest against the indira gandhi's government so the next article is maulana abul kalam azad so yesterday was his birthday also so we have to know about him he was an independent india's first education minister so in order to commemorate that his birthday is celebrated as national education day every year and he was born in mecca in saudi arabia in 1888 and he studied a variety of languages and he published lot of weekly such as al hilal and al bala so this al hilal is used as a weapon to attack and question the british policies by him but later the british because of its popularity they banned the al hilal weekly magazines and this al bala it is also later banned by the british government after abul kalam azad was extended under the defense of india regulation in 1916 so some other facts about maulana abul kalam azad are he started leading the khilafat movement after getting inspired by mahatma gandhi's philosophy of non cooperation to fight against the british so this khilafat movement is a pan islamic political movement against the british in british india okay it was in the year 1920 1922 and he also was a strong believer in the coexistence of all religious communities and he always gave priority to education so abul kalam azad always gave importance to education he actually wanted the education to be in the central list rather than in the state list because of its importance however he he was against the inclusion of the education in the concurrent list okay and he also established the board for adult education to facilitate the education among the uneducated adults and he is he was the first education minister of the country after independence so he advocated for free and compulsory primary education for all the children up to the age of 14 because he all firmly believed that the education is the basic right of all the citizens So in 1992 in order to commemorate his achievements he was posthumously conferred the Bharat Ratna which is which is the India's highest civilian award. So the next article is the power minister inaugurates inspire 2018. So this inspire means international symposium for innovation and research in energy efficiency okay so this is the second edition of such inspire program and it is being organized combinedly by eesl and world bank eesl means energy efficiency services limited and it mainly focuses on enhancing the grid management e mobility and financial instruments and technologies for the energy efficiency in india that means it majorly aims for the energy efficiency so this uh, inspire program also aims to reshape the indian energy efficiency market in alignment with the global best practices okay so uh, one more thing you have to note here is eesl and asian development bank these two combinedly signed an agreement for gef which is the global environmental facility grant of 13 million dollar for establishing of the eerf which is the energy efficiency revolving fund so these funds are mainly used for improving the energy efficiency in india so that energy efficiency revolving fund it is aims to expand and sustain the investment in energy efficiency market in india by means of building market diverse diversification as well as scale up of the existing technologies and one more thing here is eesl and world resources institute they combinedly started a challenge which is innovate to inspire challenge so thereby they invited the participants to submit sustainable and scalable solutions to the specific challenges in terms of energy efficiency as well as to propose certain energy efficient technologies and financial instruments so now we are going to see the mains articles so the first one is delhi's pollution problem the myth and the reality the second one is behind india's leap in ease of doing business the third one is protect the little helpers the fourth article is cotton prices harden on higher msp and the last mains articles is time for the government to reassess its position so the first main article is delhi's pollution problem so the living condition in the indian capital delhi is taking a severe hit as the air pollution is undergoing a very higher level of deterioration in the air quality so we all knew that the aqi the air quality index of delhi is nearly 400 so it is very worst right and also the particulate matter 2.5 and 
particulate matter 10 is also severely increasing in the air so this increase is very much hazardous to the health of the human beings and it affects the respiratory system of the human beings also so we have to take some certain kind of mitigation strategy to recognize the pollution problem and in order to reduce the pollution problem so see these are the most polluted cities these are the problems due to the air pollution in delhi and these are certain solutions there are three main problems one is the topography of delhi itself is very worse that it leaves the Delhi is more vulnerable to such kind of pollutions. So the second major problem is the Ministry of Earth Sciences recently revealed that the biggest contributor to the increase in air pollution in Delhi is the transportation sector. So it jumped like 40 percentage between eight years. So this is also a major concern. And the third one is the burning of crops by the farmers in the adjoining state such as Punjab and Haryana is also a contributor to the increase in the air pollution in Delhi. So what are the solutions? There are two things. One is a short term solution, another one is a long term. Short term in the sense, as of now, the government has to do certain traffic regulations and routine checks for the vehicles. So these are short term. But the long term is only going to be a viable option and the public transport system strategy needs to be evolved in order to achieve this long term goal. So the next article is behind India's leap in ease of doing business. So what is this ease of doing business means it is an index which is created by World Bank Group and it indicates the environment in a particular country to set up and operate the business. Okay. So our country India has actually climbed to the rank 77 from 100 among 190 countries in the 2019 year. Okay. So but if you Though we are improving in the ease of doing business, though we achieved the 77th rank, there are certain concerns because we are not improved in all the areas represented here. We are improving in certain areas and we are not improved in certain other areas. So these are the 10 parameters on basis which the ease of doing business is calculated. And if you see in terms of construction permit and in terms of trade across the border, we are actually improved. We are getting improved. So we are jumping forward, right? But in terms of registering property and paying taxes and all, we are actually lagging behind. That is, we are not yet improved. So this is what mentioned by the author in this article. So if you see in this picture, we are standing in the third position among the BRICS nations. Okay. So these are areas we improved and these are areas we are not yet improved. Okay. So now we are going to see how this ease of doing business is measured. So the small or the mid-sized companies of other countries, when they are coming to another country how they are actually dealing with those countries or how they are regulating mechanism and how much time it takes how much cost it takes everything is taken into account by the uh, world bank during this calculation of ease of doing business and to collect such data for example in case of india largest business cities such as mumbai and delhi are getting surveyed okay so after that each country is assigned a rank out of 190 countries based on the score which it earns on those 10 parameters which we already saw right so this is how the eo which is the ease of doing business is getting calculated but what is the concern in this kind of methodology in the sense it is not a comprehensive uh, methodology because it is not actually reflecting the experiences of a smaller companies or the smaller cities uh, like the partnership or the proprietorship firms these are the firms which are dominating the smaller business space but they are not taking these companies into account they are just taking care of the bigger companies and biggest or largest cities so this is not that much comprehensive and it is not actually truly representative of the business environment in any country so this is what the major concern in terms of this ease of doing business so the next article is protect the little helpers so they are talking about the pollinators like the bees wasps etc so these bees and wasps they are the pollinators which helps to transfer the pollen grains from the anther which is the male part of the flower to the stigma which is the female part of the flower so by means of these kind of pollination only our ecological balance is in highly stable position but recently the population of these pollinators are in dangerous decline and it is very much concerned because the pollinators are not only helpful in terms of ecological balance but it is also helpful in terms of economical gains and recently the IPBES which is the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services they found that the pollinators only lead to the huge agricultural economic gains in our country but if it gets declined obviously the agriculture is getting affected thereby the economic gain is also getting affected so we need to preserve these kind of pollinators that is what mentioned by this uh, by 
the author in this article and see here why they are getting declined in the sense it is mainly because of the anthropogenic factor which is the human behavior the large tracts of the natural habitats of the pollinators have been cleared for monoculture cultivation which in turn affects the population of the pollinators and the second major cause is the use of the pesticide and the fertilizers and they in turn affect the little helpers which are the pollinators because by means of using these pesticides and fertilizers the pollinators are affecting from memory and olfactory impairment lower response rates and oxidative stress which damages the cells of the pollinators as a whole and recent study also estimated that between this time gap there was a 40 to 60 percent growth in relative yields of pollinator dependent crops but the pollinator independent crops such as cereals and potatoes saw a major corresponding increase of 140 percentage so which indicates the decline in the pollinator dependent crops because of the decline of the pollinators as a whole so in recent times the phenomena of bees deserting their hives is also happening at a very faster rate and by 2014 in order to conserve these pollinators us has established a pollinator health task force and a national strategy to focus on increasing the monarch butterfly population. So it is a step take, uh, that has been taken by the US to protect the pollinators. Similarly, EU has also taken certain steps in order to conserve these pollinators. So what is the way forward here is, apart from promoting organic farming and lowering the pesticide usage, the landscape management is the very much important key in order to conserve these kind of pollinators. So the reserve forests which has been converted to pulpwood plantation has also has to be restored to make the pollinators home more thriving okay and the fallow areas in the government land should also be used to plant the flowering species for the pollinators so these are the way forward or in order to conserve these kind of pollinators thereby making our economy more prosperous indirectly so the next article is cotton prices harden on higher msp so what is the news here is usually when the new season starts and when the cotton arrival is getting increased the prices of the cottons are usually getting drop but the news here is this year the prices of the cottons are remaining firm why because of the hike in msp so recently the government has announced certain hike in msp for the cotton and because of that only even though there is more cotton arrival the prices are remaining as it is so this is what the first thing and second one is the movement of international prices any fluctuation in the international prices is also having the impact on the indian domestic cotton prices so because of all these the industries what they are doing is they are buying the cotton only for their short term needs and not for the long term needs because they expect in turn after some time obviously this cotton price will get declined or the prices will be stabilized so this is on expecting this only they just purchasing only for their short term needs so this is a major concern right so if you see one more thing to note here is the msp is very much higher that the market prices are just above the msp by 1 percentage to 1.5 percentage okay so if msp is like 10 rupees means it is market price is 11 rupees okay 11 rupee or 11.5 rupees so that much high the msp is so it is a continuation of the last article that india dismisses the us notification that india has breached the cotton mps so here mps means market price support So what the news here is the United States alleged that India provides the market price support for cotton in excess what it has reported to the WTO. So this is what stated by the US but for this India has categorically dismissed the notification on such kind of allegations by the US. So what the US is claiming here is India is paying trade distorting subsidies to its cotton farmers in excess to the limit of 10% for developing countries. So as per the WTO norms for the developing countries the subsidies for its farmers should be in the range of 10% only but if it goes beyond the 10% then it is a trade distorting subsidies. So that is what US is now alleging against India that we are India is giving like 53 to 81 percentage of the value of production to the cotton farmers thereby it is involving in trade distorting subsidies. On the other hand, India is dramatically underreported its subsidy to the WTO. So this is what stated by the US. And if you see in this uh, picture, the cotton will be coming under this de minimis provision under the amber box. We are having a blue box, amber box, green box and all right. So under this amber box, under the de minimis provision, this cotton will be coming okay so usually how they are calculating this market support price in the sense 
the difference between the applied administered price and the external reference price prevailing in that time which is 1986 to 88 and it is mu multiplied by the eligible production so this is the calculation okay but India is actually opposing this type of calculation and we are proposing some other kind of uh, calculation which is stated here. So if you see here India plus 45 countries. So here they actually wanted the MPS to be calculated by means of using the external reference period of recent period rather than the older period. So this is what proposed by India but US and other EU countries are continuously blocking India's effort for changing the methodology of the calculation. So why US is continuously blocking in the sense because they want to paint India as a culprit of of the global distortions especially in the cotton trade because that is where the US and the other poor West African countries are the main victims and if we do this it is obviously going to affect their trade opposing our move. So one more thing to note down here is the new proposal is given by India as well as other 45 countries and among this 45 33 are from the G33 which are also known as the friends of special products in agriculture. So now we are going to see what is this G33. So G33 is also known as friends of special products in agriculture countries and he, it is a coalition of developing countries. So see in this picture these are the countries of G33 okay India is also a G33 member and it is especially in regard to the agriculture and it is dominated by India and currently it has 48 members and this G33 is established prior to Kankan Ministerial Conference 2003. So what is the main aim of this G33 in the sense they always want to limit the market opening of the developing countries. They don't want to open their market to a whole extent they just want to limit the market opening so thereby they can prevent or they can protect their domestic interest and they also want to lift the limit on subsidized food stockpiling to support the poor farmers not to occupy any kind of other market or not to increase the trade they just want to preserve their poor farmers so these are the aims of this g33 and it also allow the developing countries to have food security laws and public distribution systems to use the public funds to procure the food grains so these are the aim of this g33 country especially in terms of special products of agriculture so the last article is time for the government to reassess its position so we all knew that there is a long non-stop tussle is going on between the RBI and the government and this article talking about that only okay. So what is the major issue here is the issue is revolving around the central bank's reserve which is the RBI's reserve. The government is telling like RBI is holding excess reserve and the part of those reserves should be transferred to the government but the RBI is telling like we actually need those reserves to attain the policy objective of our country or of our economy. So these are the main tussle which is going on between government and the RBI and the situation is very complex that it created certain anxiety as well as a fear among the financial market in our country. So for this tussle what the author is suggesting is the one-time transfer of RBI money or RBI reserve to the government will not structurally change the fiscal position of our economy and is not at all going to impress the investors of rating agencies also. So we have to address for the real problem which is existing between the RBI and the government. So what are the suggestions which is put forward by the author here is that the government actually now force the RBI to reassess its reserve or trying to get the some part of reserve from the RBI right but for that the author is telling like you have to first constitute an expert committee and that expert committee should have to make some re recommendation for the appropriate level of capital for the central bank as well as the remaining money should be transferred to the government and what are the ways to transfer and it should be done in a more transparent manner so thereby the financial markets are in a better position to understand the the real issue which is existing in the current scenario though we implement all these things there is a certain concern like if you if you are going to reduce the rbi reserve or if you are going to reduce the size of rbi balance sheet it will turn affect the flow of the dividend in the future so we have to take care of that also and one more concern here is the indirect tax collection is not as we expected it is very lower than what we expected so the government could not maintain the fiscal deficit target and this election year is also nearing the government is trying to relax the prompt corrective action framework and it try to increase the liquidity in the non-banking financial scape or financial space. So these are all things which raises a question that though RBA is not an independent central bank but at the same time it is having certain independence to operate itself. But the government interference in the functioning of the RBA indicates that the operational independence of the RBA is now getting curtailed. 
So this is what a major concern which is expressed by the author in this particular article. So here what they are mentioning is we all knew that the financial condition in the international market is getting tightened because of the trade war between US China and the volatility in the global crude oil prices that is it is also getting increased and the domestic elections is also creating certain uncertainty in our country. Um, apart from that, this kind of continued confrontation between the RBI and the government is also affecting the investor sentiment in the financial market, which in turn affects the growth of our economy as a whole. So these are all leads to the erosion of RBI's operational autonomy, thereby it affects the capital flow in the medium to long run. So as a way forward, what the author suggests here is the government and the RBI should carefully examine the long term cost of their decisions on the November 19 meeting which they are going to held. So apart from these articles, we have also attached 10 MCQ questions regarding the today's current affairs in the description below. Thank you.